Welcome to Firsts in Fiction Podcast, your first stop for learning to write great, amazing, awesome, totally great, amazing, awesome. Wait, what's your word? Fantastic. Fiction. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> how, how many times have I used that in the last three podcasts? That's your favorite word, yeah. And uh, apparently I just completely avoided it. And then, Anyway, welcome <laughs> to the podcast. <laughs> Today, uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, uh, including action and dialogue. We're going to talk a little bit about Aaron and um, part of the reason why he wasn't here last week, uh, a little mm-hmm. bit about his sister, um, and lots of other fun and interesting things. I'm Steve McLean, an aspiring writer. I'm Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. Firsts in Fiction. Welcome to the fo- podcast. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, I uh, just want to let you know we talk about writing. Um, we love writing. Uh, I, when I say I'm an aspiring writer, that means that I like writing for fun. I'm mm-hmm. not published um, for creative writing. And uh, Aaron is actually a pro writer. He's the man. Uh, writer. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'd say the man, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I've published, uh, published a few books. I've got another one coming out I'm really excited about. So um, but that's, that's a ways down the line still. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about it? The the next book, the book that's in the works, right? The it's the Hand of Adonai series, and I've finally been working on this thing for, oh man, um, how long have I been working on it? 2009, I think, is when a lot I started. Of yeah, it seems like it's been a while. Yeah, I'm about three books in, um, polishing off the third book, about ready to start the fourth, and mm-hmm. uh, got it, that that got picked up by a publisher, Brimstone Fiction, picked that up. So um, I'm going to be doing some edits on book one and. Uh, looking forward to some fun times with that. It's a it's a great series, real close to my heart. It's just a young adult fantasy, um, right. kind of a portal fiction, if you will, um, kind of a Tron meets Narnia kind of a thing. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, portal fiction for those of you who aren't in the know, because I would not have known that before this podcast, is uh, a type of fiction where you pass through a doorway to go to a magical world. Uh, the doorway would be the portal, right? Hence the name Portal Fiction. Yeah. Indeed. Right. Yeah, indeed. So. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> well, Aaron, why did we, why were you gone last week? Man? Uh, last week, my sister was down, uh, staying with us for a few days. She actually had uh, brain surgery on Wednesday. Had uh, what's called a decompression surgery. Uh, she has what's called carry one malformation, and that's where the tonsils of the brain in the back kind of descend down into the spinal column, and produce a lot of pressure and right. uh, can cause a whole slew of problems. Uh, the, so Tuesday night we were you know spending time with her and her family. We watched her children while she was having the, uh, the surgery um, and the surgery went very very well which is cool. Uh, the recovery process not going as well. Um, so what you can if you if you're watching on YouTube you can see here uh, at the bottom of my screen is a website link and I would really appreciate if you go there. It's a campaign to kind of help raise money to offset some of the medical bills that they are facing. Um, she's got to pay, I think, $3,000 for the surgery is, is her portion of the surgery. Plus, um, the the hospital that performed the surgery is, is about five hours from her home. So there's a lot of travel expenses, staying in a hotel room with her family, eating out while they're there, uh, and just a bunch of... Uh, kind of other things that have popped up along the way um, and the expenses kind of keep growing as she goes through the recovery process so she's not out of the woods yet uh, many of you have been thinking about her and praying for her and we definitely appreciate that if you would continue to do so we'd really appreciate it she's in a lot of pain still um, so she could, she could definitely use some prayers and she could her family could also use some financial support if you're able to do that so uh, I'm just going to leave this up on the the whole thing on the YouTube, and I'll put it in the show notes, uh, and hopefully you guys can help out with that. That would be fantastic. So yeah, yeah there, there's that word, fantastic. Right. Yay. Your favorite word. It only word. took uh, <laughs> only took what five word, five minutes to get into it. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, very cool. Um, yeah, get over and and check out the website again under Aaron's name there on the screen. Um, head on over there and give that a look if you'd like to help out. Uh, okay, so uh, talking about our our topic for today, um, dialogue and action. First of all, Aaron, uh, do you have the the um, the, the show web page up so that we can watch the the comments? I, I know, do. I know Maya was going to be attending, so she may be 
sending us some messages. I don't currently have that up. I need to get that going. Yeah, I do. Uh, Molly Joe just asked if I would uh, put the GoFundMe link up. So I did. I put that on the page for Good. those of you okay. watching the page. So. All right. Theoretically, it will come up eventually. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. So. All right. All right. Cool. All right. So Excellent. dialogue and action. Yes. Um, you want to have dialogue, and then you also want to have action within the dialogue. You want to keep it interesting. You want to move the scene along. Make sure that you're actually keeping the reader engaged with what's going on as the characters are talking, right? A absolutely. Uh, this topic is actually one that was suggested by uh, a student of mine, uh, someone I'm mentoring in writing, and uh, it's something that when I read his writing I notice it a lot and I, I've made several comments, but it's not just something that I see in his writing. Uh, it's something I see in, in pretty much all of my students' writings. And um, I've heard people say that dialogue is a break in the action, mm -hmm. which is not the case at all. As a matter of fact, Jerome Stern from Making Shapely Fiction, I believe I'm attributing this quote correctly, says that dialogue is, is an intensification of the action. So the idea is not that you throw in a conversation to give the reader a break from what's going on. Um, you want to continue when in those when you're writing, say, a conversation, let's say over a meal or something like that, there is still plenty of things going on. And I kind of like to think of it in the context of if you're watching a movie and the movie consists, you know, you've got a 15-minute scene where two people sit down in chairs and stare at each other and just talk without moving at all. Right. It's kind of bizarre. Um, and what I notice is a lot of times, especially... Um, in beginning writers, they'll go into these long conversations um, thinking, oh, I'm developing my characters, and then just completely leave out all of the action. The characters aren't moving, the characters aren't interacting in any physical way. There's a complete lack of forward momentum or physical action. And that can be problematic in our writing. Yeah. Have you ever read anything that does that, where it just keeps you disconnected from what's going on? I see it a lot in, in some of the fantasy uh, series. I'm going to pick on, on one, uh, the Wheel of Time series, and I hate to say anything negative about a series that's so well-loved by so many people. Um, but if you've read it, you, you probably know what I'm talking about when I say there are chapters, entire chapters for 50 pages where two people will walk down the road and talk, and they're just planning for the future, and nothing actually really ever happens. It's just... Yeah this long, long conversation, and you get a lot of information from it, but it becomes almost kind of an info dump at that point, and it, for me, it's a point where I really disconnected from the story. Um, of course, what's so great about those books is when you get to the end, that's when those, that action really hits, and Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson, when they're writing action, they are incredibly gifted writers, and they have some great action sequences within um, with their magic system and all of that. So a lot of things were working well for that series, but it's it's kind of problematic, uh, or at least it was for me, getting to that point. Right. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> I've read those books too. I tend to agree. Um, so what's a really good method for... Uh, how can you test what you've written to ensure that you actually have the right balance between dialogue and action to keep the thing moving? There's not a, an exact formula, um, but I think if you're going through and you see four, five, six lines of dialogue and there's no action, uh, there's no prose other than he said, she said, I think that's kind of problematic. Um, yeah. I'm, all f I'm all for the minimalists. Love Raymond Carver, uh, love Ernest Hemingway, but they will have two or three lines and then they'll have one simple sentence that'll break up the dialogue, if you will. Um, sometimes not saying something, and this is this is a great technique when you're writing dialogue, give the characters a moment to not say something, and that's pretty powerful. I really push the point that dialogue is the, the less the better. Um, less is more, you've heard that old adage. I really believe that with dialogue. We, yeah. especially beginning writers, we put in way, way too much dialogue, and I think it's because of a lack of confidence in our ability to write the action. Um, 
And so what I like to see is less dialogue and sometimes more action. So have somebody move across the room. Um, try and avoid just a stand-up, sit-down type of a stuff. Um, but uh, if you can have the characters interacting in some way, give them something to fidget with, give them some sort of prop. Props go a very long way. Put something in the room that they can interact with, whether it's a cigarette lighter or a uh, letter opener or a you know a lamp that uh, where the bulb is constantly flickering. Whatever it is, give them something that they can physically kind of or work possibly with. Possibly a lamp that you could rub. Maybe. <laughs> um, that might take our story in a different direction, but it right. would definitely be interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, do you think that you've done a very good job of this in your own writing? Or, um, you know, d describe for us how you've kind of come to this point. Was this something that's like taught in creative writing classes? Is this something that you kind of discovered for yourself? Um, and, and how did that progression of learning go? That's uh, a very good question. I would say definitely as a beginning writer, I struggled with this, I think, as all writers do. It's kind of a tough concept, how to balance it. How much is too much action? Uh, how much dialogue is too much dialogue? Um, and again, I kind of go back. The more dialogue you can cut, the better. I think of um, one of my characters in the Hand of Adonai series that really worked out for me. Uh, name is Detective Parker, and he's got... He's got a, you know what I'm talking about. He's he's got an unlit cigarette. He's quitting smoking, so he's got a cigarette that he never lights. But he's always putting it in his mouth. He's always fidgeting right. with it. He's always looking at that cigarette lighter longingly. You know, as things get a little bit tougher, he starts thinking, "Is it really that important that I quit smoking?" Right. Um, <laughs> and so it's it's a prop that I thought would be an interesting quirk to begin with. Um, but when I first wrote that character, I never planned for him to get the amount of screen time that he gets, but he's gotten quite a bit and he's become a major player in the series. I think in part because his scenes of dialogue are some of my favorite to write because mm. they're to the point. Um, he's got something to interact with and I can move seamlessly through his uh, what he says and also what he thinks. One of the other X factors here that I'll just kind of throw out there is interior monologue. You can break up the dialogue a little bit with thoughts. Just one or two. You don't need, you know, six or seven sentences or sweeping paragraphs or pages and pages of introspection, but just simple um, one or two observations that they might make. Uh, this can come in the form of, think of, think of uh, if we're having a conversation and you say something and I think you're lying. So I might, interior monologue might say, um, his eyes dilated. He he must be lying. Or his hands. Are, you know, he's playing with his hands. He's he must be lying. Yeah, or I, I notice something I about a, that. Go right. ahead. I think that's a double-edged sword, though. Um, when you keep going back to the character's internal monologue, or their thoughts in the midst of a, of dialogue, sometimes you're telling the reader, and that's something I think. Just in the midst of talking about this, we probably ought to caution about. Would you agree? Be, being too telling with it. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, if I'm talking to someone and instead of making an observation or instead of uh, appealing to some gesture or action that might indicate what's going on or even just give another piece of well-selected dialogue in order to convey mood or idea, an, an idea of what that person is feeling, mm -hmm. instead having the, um, the character that, you know, whose head we're inside thinking that so that that way, oh, hey, reader, just FYI, here's a big flashing light that says, this person is lying. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if we are writing, a lot of that kind of goes into the point of view. So if we're in third person close, um, that's fine. If we're in first person, that's totally fine. As long as we don't beat a dead horse, and I think we do that a lot. Again, it's it's unsure for when we're not confident in our writing. Um so if we're having a conversation, I think you're lying. He's lying. He's clearly not telling the truth. I can tell by the way he's doing this and this. Now that's going way too far. All I simply need is he's lying. You know, he shrugs when he lies or whatever the case may be. Whatever it is that I've noticed. Um, mm -hmm. And then move on. Jump right back into the dialogue or yeah. give me some other piece of action. Uh, what I refer to that as that kind of overtelling um, as crowbar fiction. 
It's like, right. oh, in case you didn't get it, let me say it again in different words. And I find that even in my writing now as I'm going back through cleaning stuff up. It's crowbar fiction. It's like, hey, yeah. did you get this? If you didn't get it, let me say it again and again. <laughs> <Right>. again. <laughs> I just need it the one time. Oh, we, we, we need to trust ourselves in our, our writing ability. We also need to trust our reader. Um, that's that's a <clears throat> mantra that Rob Roberge taught me. Trust the yeah. reader. Okay, They picked it up. Yeah. They got it. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm trying to take that into um into consideration a lot more often now and just never never underestimate what they're capable of understanding. Um, you know, sometimes I, I feel like um there's a tendency to drop things into the book to really help the reader along to make sure that they're tracking with you. Um and what that does instead is make the reader kind of feel like um, you're dumbing down the story for them. You're you're telling them too much, and you're providing too much um, context. So it kind of removes the mystery or the sense of awe, or um, you know, it, it just kind of takes the reader back out of the story, which is unfortunate. Molly Joe has a comment. You want yeah. me to go ahead and read that? Sure. She says, "I'm gonna just read it because it's pretty funny." In quotes, she says, "How do you write dialogue?" asked. He replied, do you mean where do the quotes go? She nodded. Also, do you capitalize the he slash she slash they after each quote mark? Hmm. He that, nodded. <laughs> with a capital H, he nodded. <laughs> I see your dilemma. Did you just put that in there? The group tells us the only time you have a lowercase uh, after the end of the quote is if the person asks, tells, or says for instance, nodded or agreed or argued would start capitalized. No, lowercase h, he argued. Versus no, uppercase h, he argued. Which is correct, Aaron? <laughs> well, I feel like this is a, an entire cast in itself, the punctuation of dialogue, which we might be able to do. Um, the Here's the way I think of it. Your line of dialogue is a sentence by itself without the quotation marks. So if you could take the quotation marks out, just punctuate it the way you normally would. The only exception is if you're doing a question mark and then a he asked, then that would be lowercase. Um, generally, you use the comma he asked or he said. Uh, if they're asking, you'd be question mark he asked. Uh, that's really about the only time that you would do that. I'm going to also caution you here on on a couple things. I would never say he argued or uh, he exclaimed or he, as yeah. Poe said in We've one of his stories, this he, before. Yeah. yeah, what is it Poe says, he ejaculated wildly. <laughs> uh, <Right. laughs> I think that's uh, definitely has a different connotation now than it did back then, but right. um, we don't, we, we only need he said, she said, and this is one of the points that a lot of people like to argue with me. Uh, oh, no, that's so boring that he said, she said. But this goes into the idea of creating the fictive dream and keeping the reader in the story. He said and she said become invisible right. to the reader. So they will read it and their mind will understand it and contextualize the framework of the quotes, the quotes but it will ignore the implications that you're reading a story. Whereas if I say he argued madly or he exclaimed excitedly or whatever the case may or even be. without the adverbs. Even without the ad adverbs. Right. Um, he said, she said is all you need. If you're putting in things like he argued or he exclaimed, it means that what's inside the quotation marks is not doing its job. If right. what's inside the quotation marks is doing its job, then you don't need anything like that. The only exceptions that I... I tell my students about are things that would be contrary to the reader's understanding. For example, if I say, quote, look out, end quote, um, with an exclamation point, uh, am I shouting that? I, yeah, in, that's in a, this instance, I don't know if you would actually need to say you're shouting that, right? I think the implication, if I have like an exclamation at the end there, the idea is that I'm shouting it. So right. I wouldn't even need to say that. Right, However, exactly. if somebody's breaking into my home and I'm trying to get somebody to hide quietly and I don't want to be detected, then it's, look out, he whispered. Okay? Right. Uh, so that's going to be contrary. I love you. 
you might expect them to whisper that or say that. But what if they shouted instead? I love you, he shouted. So if yeah. it's, you know, in those cases, if you're going to twist, you know, the way the reader is understanding it is that it, if and it's important to the story. If it's important to the story and you feel that your reader is going to misunderstand, then you might be able to clarify. Um, but I would caution you, avoid those situations as much as possible. You want your dialogue to be as clean and as undistracting as humanly possible. Right, right. Very good. Um, so, um, in dialogue, um, you're uh, you're you're going to, you know, write it out. Do you think that this is like we were talking a little bit about going back and reading the archetype that you are just written, and then realizing, recognizing what the archetype is, and then going back and looking for ways to improve or accentuate it um, in order to enhance that archetype so that you really draw on the emotions of the reader. Uh, similarly, in dialogue, you want to intersperse it with action. Is that something that you consciously do as you're writing, or is this something that you typically have to go back and do in revision? I think it's different for each writer. Um, I think I'm at a point now where I, I'm starting to do it a little more intuitively, a little more instinctively. Um, but it's never that great the first time around. I have to go back and get it in revision. And what I'll notice is I leave myself markers. He nodded. I see that one a lot. He nodded, he nodded, he nodded. I, I mean, all my characters nod and shrug. And for <laughs> me, a lot. And for me, what that says is in revision, when I go, oh, here's another nod, that's a placeholder. Now I need to find a different uh, action a different, some sort of prop for them to interact with, something else for them to do other than simply nodding um, because that's something that I rely too heavily on. And we all have our kind of fallbacks, our safety nets, and that's fine for first draft. I would definitely say you don't want to worry about this in first draft. This is something you want to look at in revision. First draft, you just get it down. I would say in revision, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, have you put in enough action? So go through and just see, see how many lines of action do I have here? Am I breaking up this dialogue with some um, interior monologue, some thoughts? If not, put a couple in. And I would also say cut a few lines of dialogue. Um, cut as many as you can, but I would challenge you that you could probably cut at least a third of your dialogue from your first draft, if not more, um, just right off the bat. Uh, and that includes, you know, a sentence within this long quote or this entire quote itself. However that looks, whatever that looks like in your revision process, um, I bet you could cut at least a third of the words in your dialogue, and that's going to make what remains much more impactful. Yeah. Excellent. I've made my point so well that you yeah. just said yes. Agreed. Uh -huh. <laughs> Fantastic. Do you I'm just, uh, I'm just nodding? I, I don't know if you got that. Oh, he nodded. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice. Anyway, okay. So let me ask you a question. If your plan or your goal is to put action in, does it matter the kind of action? Uh, you know, obviously, we probably don't want to just put in any old action, or do we? Just anything at all, or does it need to be something that's moving the story? Or does like, simple fact that it's action story? Yeah, I would I would argue that if it's action, it's moving the story. I mean, you want it to be relevant action. You don't want just willy nilly. And then he did a pirouette, like you know, something that <laughs> he's a ballerina. No, well That's maybe great. he is now. I mean, if he's doing a pirouette, <laughs> maybe that changes your entire character dynamic. But don't just throw in random things um, just to break it up. You want uh, to find a couple maybe character quirks or something that your character can use throughout that they can come back to. And then it's okay if they're doing it fairly I often. Go back to your character from Hand of Adonai and mm -hmm. the character Parker. And mm -hmm. he's, it's like he's always fidgeting you know, with his, with his fingers and finally he finds the cigarette and then he eventually gets it into his mouth. And then he starts going through motions of actually smoking this unlit cigarette all while carrying on dialogue. And it's just so entertaining and really makes you fall in love with the character. And so you're you're developing character at the same time as, you know, revealing um, this this dialogue, this interaction between two characters, and 
um, it really colors the whole thing, and, and it's it's pretty effective. I that's one of my favorite examples. So I'm glad I'm glad that you brought it up. So yeah, thank you. I, it's one of the ones. I th it saved me. It was it was that's one of the things where I hadn't even planned on it, mm -hmm. um, but I knew they needed some action, and he was just going to be a stereotype character, uh, yeah. and he's just going to walk on scene and ask a few tough cop questions, and um, it it became kind of a joke where. Uh, he put the, the first time you see him, he puts a cigarette in his mouth, and somebody says, "You know, I'd appreciate it if you don't smoke in here." He goes, "You know, I'm not smoking, and you know, it's I just keep the cigarette in my mouth." And then he asks for water, and she's <laughs> like, "Do you want real water, or do you want like a glass of, you know, air <laughs> that you can pretend right. it's water?" <laughs> and it was, it was much more eloquently. Uh, well, and it's particularly right fitting since your story is essentially this portal story from the real world, mm -hmm. where he's he's dealing with a situation where it's this imaginary place, you know, versus the real world, and at the same time, you know, he's imagining himself smoking a, a cigarette. No, it's just, it's funny when you start to actually, like, just pay attention to kind of the, the similarities in, in ironic, um, whatever, whatever you want to call it. it it's just kind of funny. <laughs> I like yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I, you know, I'm... I'm I'm wondering, tangentially, t talking about inner monologue, um, how do you handle that? Do the same exact thing with that? Do you intersperse that with action? Do you really want to go on for very long in an inner monologue? Are there similar rules to that? I would say the rules are very similar. Um, I, I, n I notice this. I've, I've been told that the way I read is different than the way girls read. Because I'll look at something like the Hunger Games, and I'll be like, "Oh, this is really cool." Especially when she gets in there and she starts like shooting arrows and killing people, and like stuff's happening. Like that's pretty cool. That's and right. The story leading up to that was pretty cool too. But the parts that I didn't like were the long paragraphs and pages of Peter Gale, Peter <laughs> Gale, and it, oh, it, it got a little bit stale for me. But I've heard Jacob girls like, Edward. Yeah, Jacob. exactly. And so apparently they're. Apparently, female readers, and correct me if I'm wrong, female listeners, um, read that a different way. They're more prone to, to be okay with it. That, oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm, it's their interior monologue. They seem to be okay with longer passages of interior monologue. They, I've been told that because I'm a guy, I want more action. But I would also say that all of our readers do. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's really hard. There was a time where stream of conscious w consciousness was very popular, a very popular style of writing where you just write exactly what's in the character's mind. And it can be a very deep way to develop your character. Mm -hmm. But it can also be very long and boring and uh, can lack that forward momentum that you want. Right. So I would say a little bit's okay, but it falls under the same rules. Give us some action with it. Um, break it up a little bit. And I would, I would caution you, same thing with dialogue. Less is more. Um, right. The more they think about something, the less powerful it is. Very cool. Yeah, um, boy, I'm I'm trying to think if I have any other questions. I uh, is there anything else that you can say about dialogue? I mean, um, I know in my own writing, I do about five thousand revisions of my dialogue. Is every time I go over it, I'm like, eh, eh, better not. You know, uh, need to need to fix that. And um, I, I find that uh, some things just come out flat. Um, I'll I'll actually rearrange the action into different places and try to get, you know, more impact in a particular scene um, or a particular part of the dialogue by, um, you know, doing more with the action in that particular portion. I guess that's a question. How would you accentuate dialogue? How would you really let your reader know by dropping in action what is an important piece of dialogue that they really need to tune into? That is a very good question. It's one I haven't really thought about. Um, but if I were to answer that offhand, I would say that the less distracting things that you have around it, the better. And mm -hmm. by that I mean, um, let's say you have a line of dialogue that is your baby. Like this is the line of dialogue that you absolutely love and adore and it's perfect for your character and it embodies everything that they are. And mm -hmm. you want to make sure that your reader gets it. You want to make sure that this is going to really pop. 
how is your reader ever going to find it if you've got three and a half pages of dialogue before it and four and a half pages after it? It's the needle in the haystack, right? So some things that you'd want to do, obviously, are distill the dialogue down to the most concise mm -hmm. it can be in order to highlight this one impactful piece. Exactly. And then what comes to mind for me is you may have action followed by stillness followed by action, and it goes right there in the stillness. Exactly. I, I see where you're going. Yeah. I mean, it, that's exactly what I was thinking of. We've talked on this podcast before about stillness. We've yeah. talked about how the stillness heightens the action on either side. Right. Um, I think dialogue's the same way. Have some stillness before that line, have some stillness after that line, and usually that's from silence. And silence can be cultivated within dialogue by providing actions without words. And that's that's what Hemingway was really, really good at, is n the non-answer. The, uh, the woman says, blah, 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 the man you know, puts his book down and takes his glasses off. The woman says, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. what we have here is the man saying nothing, and that's infinitely more impactful than him saying something, Right. if that makes sense. That's a really good point. You can actually replace dialogue with action sometimes mm -hmm. and get so much more bang for your buck. That's very good, Aaron. Uh, see, that's why, you, that's why you got the degree, right? That's good yeah. Stuff. Something um, I may have picked up along the way. <laughs> uh, just a funny little aside. Um, in our kitchen, there is a fan that runs when there's too much steam coming off of something that we're cooking. Most times, like when we're cooking noodles or something, the steam will start to billow upward, and this fan will automatically kick on from within the microwave. And it, you know, it's just there to move the air and and to try to clear out whatever is there. I think it's a way of the kitchen's way of dealing with smoke or whatever. I've never asked it, so I'm not really sure. But anyway, um, this fan kicks on, and there's no way to turn it off. We cannot turn the thing off. It, maybe there's a way. We have not figured it out. And this thing just runs for probably 15 minutes straight. And it, it's like this irritating, tension-filled, white noise that just continues and continues. And then suddenly, it stops. And there is just a noticeable release of tension in the air. And we both, every single time, we both sigh real big and go, Oh... You know, that, that, is, that is a, a really good opportunity, as soon as that ends, to plant a really good piece of dialogue, right? I would agree. And as a matter of fact, I, that whole situation that you just said, I'm already putting it in terms of fiction and thinking, okay, what you have is uh, man and wife. Um, I'm not saying that you and your wife are arguing, by the way, but if you were, if this were like some sort of like high-tension scene, um, that's done in the kitchen, by the way, which can be a very angry place, especially when you've got the stove cooking, and there's knives. And knives, and there's chopping, and there's all oh, this yeah. kind of stuff. The kitchen is just rife. Oh, man, if you ever want dialogue, you want some action, put them in a kitchen. Let them yeah. cook something. Give them something to do, and that's going to give them, you know, and it's going to layer that tension, and then that fan pops on, and it's that irritating white noise, and, you know, you say something, and then there's just the fan just the fan and the yeah. chopping of the knife and then you say something else and then finally after whatever however long it is the fan stops and that can be almost thematically tied to the ending of the um, the the argument yeah. or the disagreement and that becomes um, kind of symbolic I guess if you will and it can be this beautiful open resolve for a nice piece of flash fiction or something like that um, using things like that you're going to go a long way yeah. And I'm gonna say I'm gonna say one other thing real quick. Um, another thing, another one way to to unclutter your dialogue is to eliminate anything that somebody says simply to get somebody else to speak. Hmm. For example, I say, "How are you tonight, Steve?" And you say, "Not great." And I say, "Really? Why not? What happened?" Right. Okay. And then you tell your story. At, at this point, why can't it just simply be me saying, hey, you know, you look down, what's up? And you launching into your story. You don't need me prodding, really? And then what? And then what happened? <laughs> um, those are easy lines to cut. 
um, they save a line, like an entire line on your word processor or whatever you're using because, boom, you take that out and then all of a sudden you're, the other line goes up with the previous line of dialogue. Same person talking. It's unbroken. The flow is less disrupted. Yeah. Um, and if you think of, of dialogue with a flow, there are times you do want to disrupt the flow, throw in a little bit of action, break it up um, yeah. to call attention to important phrases, important uh, lines of dialogue like we've talked about. Um, but those lines are complete wastes. They do nothing for your story except take up words. They're hollow words. Yeah, I got to say this is this is actually a really cool conversation right now. As as you start to, because I mean you do dialogue and you just think about generally you think about what this person's going to say to that person and vice versa, and how that's going to go down, and you never think about how much. You can affect the mood, mm -hmm. drive the story, provide uh, context to the characters, do all these things with the environment and the setting. And you know, one of the things you you've talked uh, to me about, and you know, Aaron Aaron's my teacher. He teaches me a lot of things about writing. And one of the things that um, that you've told me, Aaron, is you know you, you got to appeal to the senses, and you like uh, in general to try to get at least two or three in there. And mm -hmm. then you also like to con contrast them with the, what's that special word that you use, where you use a sound to um, describe a something that you would see. S synesthesia. Yeah. Synesthesia. That's the word. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just just cool little tools where um, you know the 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 sound was very bright or the light was very loud. Just things like that. Those are weak examples, but you know where I'm going. Right. Um, elements beyond the characters themselves and what they're saying can really pick up a story and put it into a whole new level. This is very good I, conversation. I'm liking it. Yeah, the reason I'm smiling, and I, I, I'm really glad that you brought that up, because I was going through a chapter of my uh, book three on Hand of Adonai today, and I must have used synesthesia about three or four times, and there's one <laughs> character in particular that really um, utilizes that technique, and it's she's also one of my favorite ones. Um, but it's one of those things where I had a particular description in there, and one of my readers, uh, his name's Dennis, he's a very, very gifted reader and calls me out on stuff. Yeah. So he'll say, yeah, this sucks, you can do better. So <laughs> exactly. he, challenged, yeah, he challenged me there, and he's like, hey, this is, this is pretty stock. Let's find something, dig a little bit deeper. And, and so I did, and I found myself digging naturally into that, uh, that synesthesia um, because I really feel like that elevates the the description to a point that most people don't bring it most I would almost venture to say most people can't bring it they don't think in those terms but when you see it explained in that way it makes complete sense the line I'm thinking of specifically and you might tell me this sucks and if so please let me know <laughs> um, but the description was I originally had you know she sings the sunrise um, but I think I changed it to she sang in rainbows um, and the idea is rainbows are something that you perceive with sight, whereas singing is something that you perceive with the ears. So there's that that shift in how you understand a particular sense. Um, and it, yeah, I, I might even suggest you go further and say something more along the lines of prisms of light or something like that, is because, um, yeah, I don't know if that... I'd be interested to hear what Dennis says. <laughs> like a prism prismatic song, you know, Maybe. something like that. That might work. I'll, I might have to work on it a little bit more, but, but yeah, um, I like for our going. listeners, for our listeners, that's synesthesia. That's you know describing the lights in the room uh, dropped an octave. I think is the first yeah. experience I had with it, and I just immediately fell in love with that style of uh, description. So mm -hmm. we'll have to do a whole podcast on that sometime. Um, how do you spell synesthesia? Uh, S Y N anesthesia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm here to help, Steve. I'm right. here to help. That was I great. Think I think it's S Y N E S T H E S I A. Yeah. Uh, the way that I spell it is by typing it into a spell checker. Okay. Sure. Googling it. Right. Did you mean <laughs> symphony? No. Um. Yeah, so uh, Molly Joe's is asking for some more examples. Do you have anything else you can just pull out right now? Oh, oh goodness. Um, 
Okay, well, again, the lights in the room dropped an octave uh, right. would be one. Um, she sang in, in rainbows would be another. Uh, here's, here's one way that you can do it. Think of all the words that you would use to describe a particular sense, such as sight. Bright, dim, um, light, dark, uh, then something that would be sound, uh, you know, loud, soft. Um, trying to think of some other ones, and now I'm on the spot, so my brain is yeah, yeah. not working. But you would switch those. So when somebody says, wow, that's a really loud shirt, they are using synesthesia. Right. 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 Um, you might... Well, even just something simple like saying um, he had a rough voice, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a touch of synesthesia right there. I mean, rough yeah. would be a tactile sensation, yes. and a voice would be sounds that you hear. Yes. Um, so I mean, it's even it's even as subtle as that. There yes. are actually a lot of examples like that just in general everyday uh, idiomatic use. And mm -hmm. um, you know that the trick is is to take those and then to take them maybe an extra level, like um, something more along the lines of his his voice graded on graded on me like um, razor blades or something. I mm -hmm. I'm I suck at this on the spot too. So <laughs> right, you know, well, we say you know he had a sandpaper voice, um, yeah, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, that's also synesthesia. It, it does not work for sound or for for smell and for taste because we use the same uh, words to describe mm -hmm. both of those. So sweet describes smell and taste as well. Mm -hmm. um, she was a sweet sight, though. That would be technically synesthesia, very kind of basic type of an example. Um, and I wish I had my my file pulled up here. I might be able to provide a few more, but um, that's that's it, kind of in a nutshell. Maybe we'll do a, another podcast on it later when we actually are a little more prepared, <laughs> not so yeah. on the spot. Yeah, we just I am kind not of Johnny on the spot tonight. This. Yeah, what's that? I said, yeah, we just t kind of fell into talking about this. Just FYI out there, um, a lot of these podcasts are completely unscripted. Um, the questions are just whatever kind of happens. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm, I'm anyway. sure they couldn't tell. I'm sure they <laughs> thought we were reading from a script. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, well, um, let's see. I, I think that's all I have for uh, for this particular topic tonight. Anything else you have, Aaron? I think I think we're good. I think I've given uh, my tips and my tricks, and uh, hopefully, you know, if you have any other questions, feel free to drop us a line, um, tweet us, or Facebook us, or you can email us. Uh, I think you guys know how to how to get in touch with us. I'm uh, at AaronGansky.com. You can also tweet me at ADGansky or find me on Facebook. Um, we have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash firstsinfiction. Um, and, uh, yeah, email firstsinfictionpodcast at gmail.com if you want to get in touch with us. Steve, how, they, how can they get in touch with you? Well, I think we need to delete some of the ways that they can get in touch with us because that's an overwhelming list. Well, there there are six more. <laughs> uh, that I didn't mention. Right. So, actually, we need to check our Google Plus a bit more because I think a lot of people connecting with us over there. Um, yeah. I, I posted a few things over there at one point, but and man, I got to tell you guys, we are just uh, bad at keeping up with the social media these days, especially especially during the summer. Um, so hey, if there's somebody out there who wants to be a um, what is it they they call them like roadies, somebody Some, who a uh, roadie. <laughs> who tracks along with us and wants to help us out with some of our social networking, um, drop us a line. Um, just probably the best way to get a hold of us is to just go to the Fa First in Fiction Facebook page mm -hmm. and um, drop a, a message there for us, comment on one of our posts or something. Um, yeah. yeah, you can get a hold of me by going to stevemcclain.wordpress.com. You can comment there or find me on Twitter at Steve McLean. So uh, you can actually see it down at the bottom of the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and then if you're on the podcast, well, I guess you're just going to have to try to spell it several times until you get it right. Trial and error. That's right. Yep. Anyway, thank you all very much. We appreciate you uh, you tuning in. Aaron, do you want to sign us out in our usual manner? I uh, sure will. Uh, thanks all for listening. And until next week, good writing. <laughs>